Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about stress history and normalized soil engineering properties, also known by the acronym SHANSEP. We've just gone through strength normalization. We know that the underrange shear strength for normally consolidated clay uh, is a constant, right? SU over P0 prime in C is MC over 2 exponential of E0 CSL minus E0 NCL over lambda. And we're calling that the normally consolidated undrained strength ratio. When we go to over-consolidated loading, we found that there was an additional OCR term that had to be added. So the normally consolidated strength ratio for over-consolidated soil is equal to the normally consolidated strength ratio for normally consolidated soil times OCR to the lambda minus kappa divided by lambda, where lambda is the slope of the normal consolidation line and critical state line, and kappa is the slope of the unload reload line. So we'll just call this one SU over P0 prime OC, the undrained strength ratio. Our derivation previously was in terms of the mean effective stress, but it's more convenient to use vertical effective stress because we're just more accustomed to computing it. Of course, if you know the vertical effective stress and you know K0, you can compute the mean effective stress, but why go through that step? Let's just stick with vertical effective stress since we're familiar with it. Also, let's use the letter capital S to denote the normally consolidated undrained strength ratio in terms of vertical consolidation stress. The value of S should really be thought of as a material constant. It's a fundamental material property, and you can measure it by conducting undrained strength tests on normally consolidated specimens at very consolid various consolidation stresses, sigma VC prime. So the way to do this is to con normally consolidate a clay specimen in the laboratory and then shear it undrained and vary the consolidation stress that you're using for that and then do a regression. First you should observe whether the undrained strength versus sigma VC prime is approximately linear and if so, you can do a linear regression to find the value of capital S, the normally consolidated and undrained strength ratio. Furthermore, we can simplify that exponent on the OCR term. It's previously been lambda minus kappa divided by lambda, but why not lump those constants together and just define a single constant M? So instead of having to compute two different constants, now we only have to compute one. So the value of M is also thought of as a material constant that can be measured in the laboratory. The way you measure it in the lab is by conducting undrained strength tests on specimens with various overconsolidation ratios, and then using the form shown here below, uh, right in this um, area, to uh, compute the value of M. So it's a, uh, a form of regression that um, you have to do a little bit of transformation to make it a linear regression by taking a natural logarithm, but anyway, you can see how computing M from regression by testing various overconsolidation ratios would be possible. So let's talk now about the Shansep approach. It's a procedure uh, for performing laboratory testing. It's a laboratory testing protocol for accurately measuring the material constants S and M. A lot of people confuse the Shansep procedure with strength normalization and use them interchangeably. The Shansep procedure uses strength normalization concepts, but more correctly, Shansep is a laboratory testing protocol and should be thought of as such. The Shansep technique was pioneered by Chuck Ladd and is summarized very well in his 1991 Terzaghi lecture, uh, Ladd 1991. The theory behind Shansep is that obtaining a sample is known to cause disturbance to the soil. Whether you're pushing a Shelby tube or getting the best possible piston sampler, however you do it, you're, you're going to get some disturbance. You can reduce that disturbance by consolidating the sample in the laboratory device. Say you're doing triaxial testing, you put the specimen in a membrane, put it in the laboratory device, then you consolidate it to a pressure that's higher than the maximum pass pressure that the soils ever experience. So you have to do a consolidation test before you even do your strength testing to follow the Shansep procedure. By consolidating past the maximum pass pressure that the soils felt, you can 
sort of erase the effects of sample disturbance. Say you have little cracks in the soil, some remolding has happened. Well, once you consolidate it, there's so much strain that has happened now volumetrically that uh, the clay is in sort of a, a new condition and the uh, effects of disturbance have been erased. Then you can consolidate it to desired values of sigma VC prime. Note the subscript C here denotes consolidation stress. And we're using a subscript C because this is a consolidation stress that happens in the laboratory device. It's going to be different than the consolidation stress that exists in the field, which we'll use sigma V naught prime to denote. So you consolidate to various values of sigma VC prime, various values of OCR, and then you can shear the soil undrained and measure its undrained strength. Then using the results of your undrained strength testing program, you can compute values of S and M by regression of the measurements in the laboratory. The values of undrained strength measured in the lab are at different consolidation stresses and over consolidation ratios than in the field. The goal of the Shansep approach is not to directly measure what the undrained strength of the clay in the field is. It's only to measure the values of, of capital S and M the normally consolidated strength ratio and the exponent on the OCR term. Therefore, you can't take the values of undrained strength measured directly in the laboratory and, and say those, that is the undrained strength that exists in the field. That doesn't make sense because the consolidation conditions are completely different. Remember, our goal with Shansep was only to measure S and M, not to measure the undrained strength directly in the field. To get the values in the field, what we need to do is use the values of S and M combined with our knowledge of the vertical effective stress and OCR in the field. So we try to uh, estimate OCR using consolidation tests in the field. We estimate sigma V naught prime using unit weights and knowledge of the water table. And then we use the S and M values measured from the Shansep laboratory testing protocol. We can then estimate undrained shear strength. The real benefit here is that we can estimate the undrained strength that exists in the field right now because we know the consolidation condition that exists right now in the field. But let's say we have a problem where consolidation conditions are going to change. In fact, Lab, Lad's paper deals with that issue. It's about staged construction of embankments on soft clay. So a lot of the time we have to construct an embankment on a soft clay layer. The clay is not strong enough to support the full height of the embankment. So we build it in stages. We build a thin lift that the, the clay can adequately support. That lift imposes a consolidation stress on the clay. We wait for it to consolidate. As it consolidates, it's getting stronger, right? Sigma V, sigma v naught prime is going up. Therefore, S sub U is going up. By measuring S and M, we can now estimate what that undrained strength is as a function of consolidation stress during the stage construction process. So uh, the Shansep procedure allows us to understand not only what is the undrained strength right now in the field, but also what is going to be the undrained strength in the future under some different consolidation conditions. So it's much more powerful than, for example, running a bunch of unconsolidated undrained tests on field samples that might give you an indication of what's the strength right now, but it does not give you an indication of what's going to be the strength in the future. Same thing for vein shear tests or correlation with cone tip resistance and so forth. Okay, ideally the values of S and M should be measured in the laboratory. You should go out to the field, get samples, Use the Shansep procedure in the laboratory and regress values of S and M from those laboratory data. However, we know that the expense of performing these tests is often too significant for a particular project. If you have a really important project, it's a good idea to do the lab testing. Uh, if not, what you can do is use empirical values of S and M from past Shansep testing programs that have been published, um, including the ones in LAD's paper. Uh, this adds some uncertainty because you don't know the extent to which the soils that have been tested in the past are representative of the soils at your site. But nevertheless, you can use those um, and have, you know, some assurance that what you're doing is at least reasonable. 
What I'd like to do now is just walk you through Lad's paper. Uh, this is available to you through the course website, and it's a long paper, 76 pages long, very long for a typical journal paper. Uh, it is a Terzaghi lecture, which are often longer papers than regular journal papers. I'm not going to walk you through every single page of this paper. I'm going to jump around a little bit just to show you some of the highlights of the paper. This really is one of the landmark papers in geotechnical engineering, and so it would be worthwhile for you to be familiar with this and really understand it. These concepts are going to come up again and again throughout later courses that you'll take um, in the academic year. So I'm going to skip here to page 17. Okay, this is an example of a profile from the St. James Bay that uh, Ladd published in his paper uh, based on past projects that he had done. What you see is there's a, a crust layer uh, over the top of a marine clay over a lacustrine clay. So some different layers here. Um, each one of these points here is a, a plasticity index in the open symbols and a liquid limit in the solid symbols. So instead of using PI and uh, PL, he, he's using, um, or LL and PL, he's using IL and IP for plastic and liquid limits. Okay, these are the depths where he got the uh, samples for the laboratory testing profile of sigma v naught prime. And then really importantly, there are profiles of sigma p prime, so you have maximum pass pressure. Now for every one of these open circles, there was a consolidation test done, multi-stage consolidation test. Um, those can take quite a bit of effort to get and process, and then uh, they result in a single value of sigma p prime here. And what you can see, though, is that you have a full picture of the stress history here. Here's sigma v naught prime based on the assumption of a uh, hydrostatic water table. And then uh, sigma p prime is really high in this desiccated crust, probably due to groundwater fluctuation. Then you have a, a layer with a fairly constant sigma p prime transitioning to a higher value here. And he's interpreted this lacustrine layer as having sigma p prime increasing with depth. This is important because it tells you what the OCR is in the field. And that's one of the things we need to know if we're going to estimate the undrained shear strength in the field based on the S and M values obtained from a Shansep testing program. All right, skipping to page 34 now. These are example results showing undrained strength ratios. Um, these are normally consolidated undrained strength ratios here. LAD uses CU instead of SU to indicate that these are from consolidated undrained strength tests. I prefer SU, but just keep in mind that these are really the same thing. CU over sigma VC prime. This is basically the capital S, same thing, right? Uh, this is plasticity index on the x-axis. So we see that there is a correlation between the undrained strength ratio and the PI. Um, furthermore, we see that different stress paths produce different strength ratios. So TC is a triaxial compression stress path. In that case, there's almost no trend with PI. It's fairly horizontal up here at around 0 0.32, 0 0.33, something like that. Here are these circles are direct simple shear tests represented by that trend line. Those start out at a fairly low number between 0.2 and 0.25 for plasticity index in the range of about zero to 30, and then increasing slightly. So maybe by the time you get to really high PI values, you're up higher than 0.25. These pointed down triangles are for triaxial extension tests. And so those are weaker than the direct simple shear, which are weaker than the triaxial compression. Uh, so these can be as low as 0.15 and they increase more significantly with plasticity index. So what we find is that the undrained strength of soil is of clay is anisotropic. That's not a big surprise because clay minerals are like flat plates and they have a preferred particle orientation. So we would expect them to have different strengths for different stress paths. An important consideration for you is what stress path matches the field loading condition that you're analyzing the most closely. So you always want to use a strength ratio or use a laboratory test type that best matches the field conditions that you're after.
we scroll down just one more page. Now this is showing strength ratio versus OCR. Okay, before we had PI, now it's OCR. So the M constant is obtained by um, regressing the slope of this line right here. You can see this is for a triaxial compression stress path, direct simple shear is the dashed line, and then triaxial extension is this line down here. The left column is for uh, the, the AGS plastic marine clay. The right column is for St. James Bay sensitive marine clay via the recompression method. You can say they have quite different strength ratios and different slopes here. So different clays do have different M values and different S values. So throughout Ladd's paper, he went on to summarize uh, some of the findings that he had for the various types of clay that he tested uh, throughout his career. So for example, for sensitive marine clay with a plasticity index less than 30 and a liquidity index, which is water content minus plastic limit divided by PI, greater than one. So that means the liquid limit is greater than the plastic limit. Uh, sorry, the water content is greater than the liquid limit. What Ladd found was that the normalized, uh, the undrained strength ratio normally consolidated was 0 0.2 plus or minus 0 0.015. And that's for a direct simple shear stress path. So it's always important to tie a particular S value to a particular stress path. Most commonly we'll be doing simple shear stress paths because that tends to match the average stress path for a lot of field problems that we'll be solving. Not always, though, so sometimes you'll need to do a path correction to your undrained strength. Furthermore, Ladd found that the M value was approximately equal to 1. So there was a linear relationship between undrained strength and OCR for these sensitive marine clays. Now, most clays do not have a really high sensitivity, particularly those that we encounter uh, in Southern California. So we may not want to use this particular empirical relationship for a lot of the sites that we might encounter but you know sometimes we do deal with sensitive marine clays and it's nice to know that lad has published this so that we can rely on them if we are not able to do a laboratory testing program if we move on to homogeneous sedimentary clay with a pi in the range of 20 to 80 lad found that the normally consolidated undrained strength ratio was 0.2 plus 0.05 times pi divided by 100 so we previously showed that plot where we had the different uh, strength ratios versus plasticity index, and there was a trend there for the direct simple shear and triaxial extension stress paths. Not so much of a trend for triaxial compression, but uh, this is reflected in the equation here that was presented by Ladd. Um, the M value he found was 0.88 times 1 minus CR over CC which is also approximately equal to 0.8 plus or minus 0.06. Notice that 1 minus CR over CC is identical to C sub C minus CR all over C sub C. And that's the same as lambda minus kappa over lambda. So the M value that he's presenting here reflects the functional form that we just derived uh, for the um, normal, for the normal consolidation line being parallel uh, to the isotro to the uh, critical state line, right? So that form is reflected there in that value of M. So if you do the consolidation test and you know CR and CC, you can plug them in here. If you don't have the consolidation test, uh, you can uh, just use 0.8 plus or minus 0.06 for homogeneous sedimentary clay. And that does match pretty well with a lot of sites that we might come across. Probably we'll come across more sedimentary clays than sensitive marine clays. Ladd also tests northeastern varved clay. Uh, varved clays um, involve a formation where uh, flood events carry fine-grained sediments and they settle in thin layers depending on the sediment load from a particular storm event. So you end up with this, um, this sequence of thin layers where the coarser particles, maybe the siltier particles, are at the bottom and then the, each varve becomes progressively finer to the top then another varve will come in on top of it with the siltier particles uh, progressively finer to the top again. So varve clays actually can carry a record of past um, rainfall events. But anyway, for the northeastern varved clays, Ladd found that the 
uh, normally consolidated strength ratio was 0.16 and the M value was 0.75. And again, these are for direct simple shear stress paths. Then if we move on to sedimentary silts and organic silts, so organic silts are not peats, right? These are silts with some organic content. Lad found that the value of S was 0.25 plus or minus 0.05, again for a direct simple shear stress path and M was equal to 0.88 times 1 minus CR over CC, which is also 0.8 plus or minus 0.06. Based on the aggregate of all of these results, uh, the following assumption is often made uh, for simple shear stress path based on the results presented by LAD. So people are often assuming that S is somewhere in the range of 0.2 to 0.25, maybe 0.25 for a higher plasticity soil, 0.2 for a lower plasticity soil, and then people often just assume that M is equal to 0 0.8. So these are common assumptions you might see in practice uh, for cases where you can't run the laboratory tests. Oftentimes it's okay to make these assumptions. You can accept that uncertainty, but you should be aware that you are making an assumption and that it does carry some uncertainty with it.